Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to Eden Outpost. And we are going to and as mothers. So before we start, Christian Father who dwells up here and above in heaven, Jehovah God, we thank you for this for your daughter. May you use me as a vessel, dear Lord, in the dearest name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray to stand forevermore. Amen. Okay, so this is our topic that we are looking at today. Uh, it is called Raising Your Children. during the crisis, raising your children during the crisis. And as you see on the photo, we have Jesus on the other side. We have a praying mother there with the son and they are praying. So the a guardian, whoever is taking care of the children out there, that you cannot do this way with Jesus by your side. Especially, I want us to start with the Bible verse. It is found in the book 127, Psalms 127. Law, children, are a, is his reward. So you gift from the Lord. So there, but we should know that every child is a and God is the one who allowed that child to be born in, in that family without making a mistake some of the things that are affecting who are raising up children in this time of the crisis Control. It is found in the book of Adventist Home. Your compassionate Savior is watching with love and will render you the assistance which render you the assistance which you need. He knows the burdens of every mother's heart and is at this quotation. He's telling us that the Savior is watching with love and with tender mercies. He's watching with sympathy and is ready to hear your prayers. He's ready to hear our prayers and to render the assistance that we need. He knows the burdens of every mother's heart and is her best friend. Isn't that wonderful to know that Jesus is our best friend, not only in the time of trouble, but even in good times and bad times, even in the times of emergency. It says his everlasting arms support the, the God-fearing, faithful mother. When upon earth, he had a mother that struggled with poverty, having men, many anxious cares and perplexities, and he sympathized with every Christian mother in her care, in her cares and anxieties. That savior who took a long journey for the purpose of relieving the, the, the anxious heart of a woman whose daughter was possessed by an evil spirit will hear the mother's prayer and will bless her children. So this is a wonderful promise. When Jesus walked on the face of the earth, it is giving us a scenario of how Jesus 
was raised by her mother and he knew the cares that Mary used to go through because he, he was born in a humble family. And he's saying that she, he used to watch the struggles that the mother used to go through. Just like we are talking right now, most of the families, their breadwinners, they've, they've lost employment. You find that a mother who had who was working somewhere or a mother, if she was a housewife and the husband used to work, there are single mothers out there. They don't have enough money. They are struggling to put food on the table. They are struggling to just feed their children. Take heart, Jesus is watching and he will never let you go. Just hold on to him. That's why here we've seen he's saying his everlasting arms support the God-fearing, faithful mother. When you pray to God, God is going to answer your prayers. God is going to provide your daily bread. So when you look at all this, it says that Jesus even walked a long journey just to go and meet that woman who had a daughter who was demon possessed. It was not by chance that that woman met Jesus. Jesus knew that where he's going because he saw that mother, the agony that she used to go through. Jesus knew wherever he was that there was a, 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 a lady or there was a woman who was looking, who was praying for his help. So he went there to meet that woman and God relieved that mother and saved that daughter who was demon possessed. It, it goes on to say, he who gave back to the widow her only son as he was carried to the burial is touched today the believed mother, he who wept tears of sympathy at the grave of Lazarus and gave back to Martha and Mary, who remembered his mother when he was, he who appeared to the weeping women and met them his message of a risen savior. He is ready to aid her in all the relations of life. So we see, we are seeing Jesus he has seen this woman, she death took that son away also, and she was weeping. And Jesus could not allow that because where Jesus is, there's life. Where Jesus is, there's no death. So Jesus walks and goes to meet this funeral train as they were taking this young boy to go and bury bury him, sorry, and the mother, they were sympathizing with this widow because she was left with this child. And so Jesus had to come in at the right time. He's always on time. And he had to stop that funeral train just to, to resurrect this boy. Just imagine how happy the mother was when he was given, when she was given back her, her son. And here we see also Jesus resurrecting Lazarus, the only brother to Martha and Mary. And it says that Jesus is the best friend to every mother or to every woman. Jesus is our best friend. You know, the world have, they've set a day like today, they were celebrating Women's Day. But as we see in the Bible, Jesus does not have a day that he a special day for women, no, or this is a special day for a lady, or this is a special day for my children minute. Every second, he's our best friend. He does, this is now women's day, this is when I will hear their prayers. No, Jesus, his ears are always ready to answer our prayers, and he, he is indeed our best friend. Look at this woman. She's a praying woman, the power of a praying woman. She has taught the daughter to pray also. Let's read. No work can equal that of a Christian mother. She takes up her work with a sense of what it is to bring up her children in the nature and admonition of the Lord. How often will she feel her burdens weight heavier than she can bear? 
and then how precious the privilege of taking it all to her sympathizing savior in prayer. She may lay her burdens at his feet and find in his presence a strength that will sustain her and give her cheerfulness, hope, courage, and wisdom in the most trying hour. So here it is saying that a Christian mother, many are the trials that as mothers we go through. Many are the trials that we go through because the devil, if he cannot use your husband, or if, if he cannot use my husband, he will definitely use the children. And the devil, I was reading a quotation which said that the devil waits with eager as the child is born. He's ready to sow the seeds of discord. So as a parent or as a guardian, you are the one who's supposed to guide these tender steps towards Jesus. And many are the times that the children will, will break your heart because you are telling them to do this, they'll do the other thing. We should not tire, but we should pray like the way we, we, we are reading that Jesus is always sympathizing with us. When you are seeing that we've, we, the burdens that we are carrying, they are heavier on us, Jesus is ready to help us. Because we remember in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, is this chapter 7, 28 or 11, 28? The Bible says in the book of Matthew 11, 28, it says, what? It, it, it tells us to go to Jesus and take, take our yoke to him because his burden is light and ours, which are heavy that we cannot carry on our own, we can give it to Jesus. Let's just go to that verse, Matthew chapter 11, 28. Matthew 11, Matthew 11, I don't want to paraphrase, I want to get it the way it says. Matthew 11, Matthew 11, verse 28. The Bible says, Matthew 11, 28, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So it is telling us that the yoke of Christ, it is easier, and we are going to find rest. Are you having trouble with your children? Are you having teenage, teenage children? Or are you having children who are in their youth stage and they, are, they can't listen to you? You feel like you've done zero work. Do not despair. Take it to the Lord in prayer. He's the only one who can speak to your children. He's the only one who can sympathize with you. He's the only one who knows what is best for them. Pray, pray, pray. Don't give up. And when you pray, he says that the sympathizing savior in prayer, she, she may lay her burdens at his feet and find in his presence a strength that will sustain her and give her cheerfulness. So when we take our burdens to the Savior, we are going to find cheerfulness. We are going to find hope. We are going to find courage. We are going to find wisdom in the most trying hours. Look at this woman. She's stressed because this little boy is just crying and she doesn't know what to do. Are you in this situation that you don't know what to do with your children anymore? You don't know what to do with your child anymore. You are passing through a trying time. I was talking to a certain woman and she was telling me when this COVID came, my husband lost employment and I don't, my work also I don't have enough, enough money to feed my children. But even when I'm out there looking, uh, trying to find out what I can do just to bring something on the table, the children will be calling me, asking me, what are we cooking? Are you in that situation? Take it to the Lord in prayer. One mother is the consciousness if mothers would go to Christ, more frequently and trust, and they would find rest to their souls. How many times do you run to Jesus? How many times do you go to Jesus just to empty your heart, just to tell him what is happening to you? He is our friend. When we speak to him, he listens. Speak to him and he will answer you. Speak to him. Don't get tired. 
continue speaking to him and he's going to answer your prayers and he's going to do something that is going to help you on your day-to-day -day life. You cannot, as, as a Christian mother, you cannot lead your children to Christ if you don't have time with your Savior. Find time in your busy schedule to speak to the Savior. As we are seeing this picture, these are children. Let's see. When God asks, where are the children? Parents who have neglected their God-given responsibility must meet that neglect in the judgment. The Lord will then inquire, where are the children that I gave you? To train for me, why are they not at my right hand? Many parents will then see that unwise love blinded their eyes to their children's fault and left the, those children to develop deformed characters and fit for heaven. And fit for heaven, others will see that they did not give their children time and attention, love and tenderness. Their own neglect of duty made the children what they are. This is the question. This is the book called Child Guidance, page 561, paragraph one. You know, God is going to ask us parents, where is the little flock that I gave you? If we've been too busy with the work of this world, if we've been too busy to look for money, yes, the children, they need the shelter. They need those basics. They need the clothes. They need the food. But the, the first thing that the children need is our presence, our love and care. When a child knows that you are there for them, they are going to do everything because sometimes it's not the food that they need. Sometimes it's not the clothes that they need. They just need a listening ear. They just need a mother to be there so that they, in case of anything, they can go and tell a mother. But how many mothers are out there? They don't even know how the children have been. They come from work, they are tired. They just come and leave the shoes there. The maid is there preparing the food. And from there, they find the children sleeping. They leave the house when the children are sleeping. They come back to the house when the children are sleeping. How many mothers are doing that? And we don't know the characters that our children are developing. And at the end of the day, we are going to be asked, where is the little flock that I gave you? So it says parents who have made day. The Lord will then inquire, where are the children that I gave you? And many, they won't have any answer because God will tell you, I gave you these children to do what? To raise them. In fact, here it is saying, I gave you to train for me. And when you're looking at training, you don't train a child one day. You cannot train a child one day. That's why when, they, when, 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 when scientists they were studying about a child, they say when a child is born, the brain is like a plain paper. They don't know anything. Whatever our children have become is what we've taught them. If we've not taught them, we have that box in our house called a TV. You find that a child watches television the whole day, the whole night, the TV, it, it is just on. So if we don't have enough time to speak to our children, if we don't have time to be with our children, we leave the TV to, to train our children. Then when God asks us, where I gave you these children to train for me. The verse we started with was Psalms 127, verse three, which was saying, children are a gift from the Lord or children are a reward from the Lord. How are we going to answer our God? Okay, look at this family. Are they not happy? There's the mother there, the father is there, the children are there. What does it say? Families will pass in review before God. When parents and children meet at the final reckoning, what a scene will be presented. Thousands of children who have been slaves to appetite and debasing vice, whose lives are moral wrecks, will stand face to face with the parents who made them what they are. Who but the parents must bear this fearful responsibility? Did the Lord may make 
these youths corrupt? Question mark. Did the Lord make these youths corrupt? No, oh no. He made them in his image a little lower than the angels. So when the children are born, they don't know anything. They don't know sugar. They don't know snacks. They don't know junk food. They are just born innocent. So now it is now the training. In fact, training starts when the baby is conceived in the mother's womb. When the baby, the moment the baby is conceived, the mother knows that she's carrying a child. The training should start. Not whereby you become pregnant. I saw another lady saying that she can't even eat. It's lunchtime. She's just seated looking at people, said, ah, me, I don't eat. And she's, she's heavily pregnant. Now imagine if she's not eating and she's carrying someone who needs to eat. You find someone says, no, me, I'm just going to be eating junk food. I, I heard someone even at this pregnancy has made me to, I, I, I hear someone saying, this pregnancy has made me, I want to drink beer. That's not, I think that's the devil. How can someone, you become pregnant and then all of a sudden you have the thirst for beer. So you need to start training that child while that child is in your womb. When this pregnancy demands something that you know that it is not right, just say no. Take something that is health, eat something that is right. And then from there, you're going to see that God is going to help. Because when you start training this child while this child is in, in your womb, even when the child is born, the training will continue. That's why you don't train for one day. You don't train for one month. You don't train for two months. You train until you reach a time, a point whereby this child has the power to decide. I was reading something that Anton LaVey was interviewed. He, Anton LaVey, for those who don't know him, he's a, he was the first priest of the Church of Saturn in the United States of America. He's the one who built the church of Saturn and he was their first priest. And he was, he was being interviewed. He, Anton LaVey just died a few years ago. Mm. And on that interview, he was asked, Anton LaVey, you being the priest of Saturn, you, you are a Satanist. So how do you, uh, have you allowed your children also to join, to be worshiping the devil? He told, in fact, he told them, he said, no. In fact, what I've done in my house I don't allow my children to watch TV. And then the interviewer was so shocked. How? Why don't you allow your children to watch TV? Because you said you've, not al you've allowed the children to decide for themselves. You're not forcing the children to join you in worshiping the devil. He said, yes, I've not allowed my children to watch TV because TV is the Satan's altar. It's Satan's altar. In fact, that's what he said. He said, TV is the Satan's altar. I have a daughter who is 13 years old. She has never watched a TV. Imagine, and this is the person who was worshiping the devil. If him, he was worshiping the devil, but he could protect his children from beholding what is evil. And not only that, even Madonna was asked the question. Madonna also said, I don't allow my children to watch TV. In fact, they don't watch this BET, I don't know, awards or whatever it is called, those musical uh, channels. He said, I don't allow them because I don't want my children to be corrupt. But these are the people who are busy corrupting other children, who are busy corrupting children whose parents are not there. Because us, we just put the TV so that we keep our children busy. But one day, God is saying, what a sin. When parents and children meet at the final reckoning, especially now with this COVID-19, most of the children were at home. Most of the children were, were, were at, at home. And what were the children doing? They were busy watching television. Television. What does television mean? Tell a lie. Go and find out. Television. What does it tell a lie in a vision? That's what the word means. So when the children were, were, they had closed school, you find out that all these, I don't know if it's six weeks or five weeks that they've stayed at home, what they did, they were just watching TV, cartoons the whole day. 
the children are just watching, watching and eating, watching and eating. And that at the end of the day, when they go back to school, they come back. They are not the children that would be happy to present before the Lord. Okay, so when you are when you're looking at this, you will. Sorry, when we are looking at this family, it is a happy family, but you know the devil is waiting, eagerly waiting to sow a seed of discord. This is a series that we are going to do for many Sundays. This is just the, we are just laying the foundation. By God's grace, we'll be doing it every Sunday. Every Sunday we'll be doing it so that we can continue learning at the feet of Jesus. We can continue learning at the feet of Jesus. Look at these parents. These are new parents and they are happy. But let's see. Parents, if you lose your opportunity, God pits you. For in the day of judgment, God will say, what have you done with my flock, my beautiful flock? Suppose you should get to heaven and none of your children be there. How would you say to God, here I am, Lord, and the children which thou hast given me? Heaven marks the neglect of parents. It is recorded in the book of heaven. So it says, God is going to ask us a question. What have you done with my flock, my beautiful flock? When God looks at us, parents or guardians, God has placed a high regard on parents. And he has said there's a reward for parents, for faithful parents. That's why we started with the quotation about mothers. We've read, looking at how Jesus is our best friend. When we cry to, to him, when we take our burdens and cares to him, especially in this time, I've, I've heard a lot of stories whereby their mothers who are going through a trying time. They've married, they've, they've gotten married to abusive husband. And because of this COVID-19, husband, husband and wife, they've stayed at home together. And because of that, they've been, they are passing through a lot of abuse. Others are beaten. And as you see, especially here in Kenya, I think we've heard there are a number of women who've been killed just during this period from January to this is May there are a number of women who have been murdered by their own husband or their boyfriends. So we are seeing that there's a, a, try, a trend that is going on. But as a mother, you don't need to, to run to a neighbor to tell them your problems. First of all, before you go even to your mother or before you go to your auntie, run to Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who created that husband. Or oh, Jesus is the, is, the, is, is, is the one who created the children. He knows what you're going to. So he says that he's going to ask us a question. We need to do a part. As a faithful mother, let us do a, our part faithfully. And what we cannot do, let us leave it to God. Who then has done the fearful work of forming the life character? Who changed their character so that they do not bear the, in, the impress of God and must be forever separated? Must be forever separated from his presence as too impure to have any place with the pure angels in a holy heaven where the sins of the parents transmitted to the children in the, in the where the sins of the parents transmitted to their children in a permanent, in, in a perverted appetite and passion and was, and was the work completed by the pleasure acting to properly train them according to the pattern given her. All these mothers will pass in review before God just as surely as they exist. So this is what God is telling us. You know, when you read this book called Child Guidance, this is the last topic that Ellen White wrote. She was shown, and that, that last topic, it is, it is the topic called the reward. Mothers who are faithfully training their children, 
they will be rewarded. And she, she pictured the mother of Nero. She said, when you read the whole chapter, she said, Nero was so cruel and the person who made her, who made him to be so cruel is the mother. And the mother before the judgment seat, he's going to, she's going to stand and to be answerable to God because Nero was so cruel. He killed a lot of Christian, Christians. At one point, he even went and burned the whole village and said the people who burned the village are the Christians and Christians were persecuted. Because of what? Because of the way Nero was raised by a cruel mother who was used by the devil to, to, to put uh, evil in this little child. And when Nero became the king, he persecuted a lot of Christians. So look at this family. There is a mother, there's a father, there's a, there are children. I know there are some people who are single parents. You can be a single parent but live according to the will of God. Ask God to guide you. Because as a single parent, it's very difficult for you to be both. You are a mother and a father. You have to be tough to your children to play a law of a father. And you also need that tenderness of a mother. So most of the, the families that I've seen that are single parents, children who've been raised by a single parent, you can even tell because most of these children their mothers, maybe they were not strict or they were too strict such that these children now, they, they are just there. So you find out that most of the children who were raised by single parents, they'll be just there. Sometimes they'll be, they, they don't have a father figure or they don't have a mother figure. So you find out that as they are growing, they are trying to balance. Why is it that me, I don't have my father or I don't have my mother? when these children are there, when they see their friends playing. But as a mother, as a single mother, we read when we are starting that Jesus cared even for the widow. She was a widow. She had lost her only son. And when that son died, Jesus walked and went to meet the funeral train as they were going to bury that child because Jesus cared for that woman. And he had to resurrect that child and how happy the mother was. Okay, let parents and children remember that day by day. Let parents and children remember that day by day, they are each forming. They are each forming a character and that the features of this character are imprinted upon the books of heaven. God is taking pictures of his people, just as surely as an artist takes pictures of men and women, transferring them, tra transferring the features of the face to the polished plate. What kind of picture do you wish to produce? This is the question that will leave with you this tonight. We are going to continue on Sunday. We are going to start from here. It is saying that each and every day, Parents, both mother and father, if you are a guardian, you are taking care of the children. Remember that day by day, they are each forming a character and that the features of this character are being imprinted upon the books of heaven. God is taking what? God is taking pictures of his people just as surely as an artist text pictures of men and women. Yesterday, I think on, not yesterday, on Thursday, I went to Sarit and then I found an artist there. He, he was having his brush and his paint and the plain paper. And I saw, I, I got interested because I saw people were stopping there and you look at them and start painting, start painting. And at the end of that photo, this person will look exactly the way she is. If she's wearing uh, specs, he will put specs. If she's wearing a mask, she, he's going to put a mask. If she has some special features or if he has some special features, at the end of it all, you find that this piece of art, when you look at it, you indeed say, oh, this is me. This is me. So this is what God is saying. He's even saying as pictures of men and women transferring them 
transferring the features of the face to the polished plate, what kind of picture do you wish to produce? Is it a picture that is going to be deformed? Or is it a picture that when heaven looks at it, they're going to smile at it? Because as, 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 as parents, as Christian parents who are living in our communities, we are the light of the community. We are the heart of the church. We are the heart of society and we are the heart of the nation. If as Christian parents, we can faithfully do our parts. If as Christian parents, we can do what God has instructed us to do, not to leave our responsibilities to transfer them to our maids, not to leave our responsibilities to transfer them to the teachers or to leave our, 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 our responsibility to transfer them to our Sabbath school teachers at, at church. Then when each parent is going to do his work faithfully, then our society are going to change. Our communities, we are going to see change in our communities because our children, when they leave our homes, they go to mingle with other children. What character are these children taking from our home to, to mingle with others? Or is it that our children are the ones who are bringing in bad character or bad influence? We don't expect a minister we don't expect a minister to do that work that a mother should have done since the time she conceived until the time that the child has started going to church or since the child has, has joined this, uh, maybe it's adventurer or pathfinder or ambassador or AY. No, that is the work we are supposed to do. When you look at the church where you're congregating, when you look at the youths there, how do you see the youths? And when you look at their mothers, how do they look? When you look at their parents, you know, there's parents who are so strict until when you look at the children, when the children have become youths, they've rebelled and they've then stopped coming to church because they were restricted. They, they, they were so much restricted. They were not given, they didn't have any say. But as a Christian mother and a Christian father, you, we need to train our children in the way of the Lord. Proverbs says that. Let's, we are going to end with this verse. Proverbs chapter. Proverbs, we go to the book of Proverbs. The Proverbs chapter six, let me check. Proverbs. Proverbs chapter. Okay, let me let me just check it out. Proverbs chapter five. Proverbs chapter five. Proverbs chapter five. When you look at the book of Proverbs, starting from Proverbs chapter one, every time that this starts, it starts from chapter two, the first verse, chapter two, verse one. It says, my son, if thou wilt receive my words. So the Bible, when you're looking in the book of Proverbs, it will say, my son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding, then God starts speaking. When you go to Proverbs chapter three, it starts with my son. Forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. When you go to Proverbs chapter 4, it starts also, Hear, my, hear ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. So you see, as, as this book of Proverbs is going, it just goes, even Proverbs chapter 5 says, My son. Attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding. Verse 6 also says, chapter 6, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger. So it is a proverb that is trying to tell us that every time Christ is referring to us, we are his children. And when we behold Jesus or when we behold God as our father, we need to have his character. When we are talking to our children, let's apply wisdom. And wisdom comes from God. I want us to read Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. 
as we are finishing Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Proverbs 22, verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So it tells us that train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's grown, he shall not depart from it. I remember when we were growing up, my father was in a military and he was a commando. My father did, used to discipline us. He was not an Adventist, but I thank God for him because we are who we are today because of him. I'm seeing most of the mothers today or fathers today, you cannot even pinch your child. And the Bible says, spare the rod and spoil the child. In our house, there was a law. My father would tell you by 6 p.m., whether you've gone to school or wherever you are, you have to be in the house. Whether he's there or he's not there, that was a law. Whoever was coming under our roof, he used to abide. So even if my father would come home at 01 a.m., children, everyone under his roof, they have to enter the house. Six, you are in the house. And it saved us from many evils. And when you missed, my father would not spare the road. But we thank God for that training because it is because of him that we knew that you should not do A and you should not do B, you should not. He would sit with us and counsel us, me and my brother. He would be there for us and tells us about how the world is. He would tell, he would tell you, even when we are going to boarding schools, my father would say, sat me down and told me, Sheila, you are a girl. You are going to a boarding school. If you were here and behaving because I was there, where you are going, I won't be there. Remember, out there, there are diseases. If you go sleep around, you are going to become pregnant and you're going to be sick. Remember, the God that you worship will always see you, whatever you're doing. Even if I've not known, just know that God is seeing you. That was the counsel that my father gave me. And when we left, I knew that even if my father is not here, we used to restrict me to enter at six. He's not there. I'm now an adult. I'm, I've gone to college. I can do whatever I want to do with my friends. But I knew that the God that I knew is already watching over me. So this is the counsel that we need to give to our children, that we should train our children in the way of the Lord, that even when they are old, they won't depart from that because they will remember that there is a God who never sleeps nor slumber. Even if they are alone playing, they know that there is a God that is watching over them. Even if they are in the secret places, they go to boarding schools, they go to schools, they find people are smoking weed, they won't join because they know that even if my parents are not seeing me, there is my parent in heaven who is always with me. So may God watch over us parents and may God give us courage. We know that Jesus is our best friend. Next week, we are going to look, we are going to look at the physical neglect, med medical neglect, education neglect, emotional neglect of parents and children. Today, we are just laying the foundation, but as we as from next Sunday, we are going to look at the physical neglect, the medical neglect, the education neglect, and the emotional neglect of parents and children. So may God bless you and keep you. What we are going to remain with a question that every parent or guardian should ask himself, or those who are looking forward to be parents is, what kind of a picture am I producing? What kind of a picture am I producing? What kind of a picture? If that picture can be shown, let me say on Sabbath morning, when you've gone to church and then during men's service, as, as they're announcing before the, the preacher could stand, if they can take the picture of the whole week or the video of the whole week and put it in front of the church, would you be proud to watch that? Would you be proud to behold what you've been from this Sunday until Sabbath? Would you be proud to look and behold what you've been doing. 
If not, we need to ask Jesus to help us, especially as parents. We need to find time to speak to Jesus. We need to find time to behold the image of Jesus because the Bible says, by beholding, we become changed. Changed into what? Changed into his character. That's why when we are allowing our children to watch TV, how do they behave? I just want to put this into, into something that we can use on. How do they become? Our children, they won't sit down. You send a child, bring me a cup. The child will run. Because when you are watching those cartoons, the cartoons, they don't sit down. They are watching Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry, you can watch even for six hours. Those cartoons, they don't sit. They'll be just running. So by beholding, as our children are beholding such things, they are becoming changed into the cartoons. So may God help us. As we are ending, we are going to pray to ask God to give us strength that as we are passing through this crisis, we should not neglect our children and it should give us enough strength just to guide our children according to his will that at the end of the day, us and our children will be saved. Shall we pray? You can pray for us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for guiding us. We pray that you teach us how to train our children and us because an account will be asked when we go to heaven. Where are the little flow? Where is the little flow that you give us? Give us wisdom, give us power. And I pray for all the parents who've joined, both on Facebook, YouTube, and even on Zoom, be able to prepare for the soon coming crisis. Abide with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Until next time.